God's got something for you. I tell you, I, I'm so excited. I am every week. I'm excited every week to teach. But this week, I, I don't know, it's just something powerful that I felt as I was preparing to continue teaching you on the joy of the Lord. And that's our subject. We're on the joy of the Lord, and, and I'm going to be going a little more in detail. I remember as a child, and I'm, I'll get into this in a second, one of my favorite songs as a kid was, I got the joy, joy, joy down in my heart. And uh, that's a powerful song for a kid to learn. But I want to tell you, in the song, it said, there's a, a chorus part that says, But I'm so happy, so very happy, I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. And I'm so happy, so very happy, I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. But can I tell you that joy is much deeper than happiness. Joy is a spiritual fruit. In fact, our first verse, I think, is going to be up here. It talks about in Galatians chapter 5, as it lists those fruit of the Spirit. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is, and it has love, but what I want to focus in is joy. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. So we understand that joy comes to us the same way that an apple grows on a tree, a Spirit-filled life just produces joy. But that's not all. In, in another verse we've been looking at is out of Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, that says, remember, I preached a whole series on this, but I, I'm now sitting on that last line. And he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those who, for whom nothing is prepared. For the day is holy unto our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, I know I saw that. He says, do not sorrow. Can I tell you something about life? Sorrow may visit your house, but don't let it take residence. You can help but have moments of sadness, and we'll talk a lot about that in a minute. But see, to the Spirit-filled Christian, now I'm believing that's you, that's us. To the Spirit-filled Christian, joy is more than a possession. It's a position. It's a place you stand in. You stand in the joy of the Lord, and the joy of the Lord gets you th through things. Now, let me explain a couple things. I didn't go into this last week, but I want to cover it today. Now, joy is possibly the most misunderstood word that we refer to in the church. And, and it's, but it's also one of the most desired fruit of the Spirit. I like joy, especially what I consider a manif natural manifestation of joy. But understand, one of the reasons it's so... Uh, coveted by people is people just want to be happy man years ago back in the 80s i think it was some guy came out singing don't worry be happy and uh it was a cool little tune you know don't worry be happy you know and everybody thinks i want to be happy you ask some young couple getting ready to get married what do you want we just want to be happy it's kind of like in miss america contest what do you want i'm just here for world peace i want world peace no matter what the subject, they always go around to world peace. Well, all of us want to be happy. And the problem is people misunderstand joy because they think that joy is happiness. But happiness is an emotion. And because it's an emotion, uh, it's not the same. Joy, joy from heaven, the joy of the Lord is a spiritual force. Happiness is an emotion that you feel. And see, everyone wants to be happy. In fact, I want to read you what I found in USA Today. The headline said in, in this article in USA Today said, Psychologists now know what makes people happy. And, and in that article, here's what they said. They said the happiest people in the world surround themselves with family and friends. The happiest people don't care about keeping up with the Joneses next door like you, Vicky. They can't. They won't try to keep up with you. The happiest people lose themselves in normal daily activities and most importantly, happy people forgive easily. They went on to say that uh, the happiest people spend the least time alone. They pursue personal growth and intimacy. They judge themselves by their own yardstick and never worry as much about what other people think as long as they're doing what they really feel like they ought to be doing. And I want to tell you, happiness is a great thing. But it's not joy. And here's the difference. Happiness is connected to your emotions. And, and because here's, it, it, happiness is this good feeling on the inside, 
But because it's an emotion, it's connected to events and experiences. If something great happens, you're happy. If something bad happens, you're not happy. Many of you have heard that term. He's not a happy camper. I want to tell you something. I hate camping, so if I went camping, I would not be a happy camper. You know, if, I, 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 I'm not a wilderness guy. I grew up in the wilderness. I escaped as quick as I could. I grew up in the wilderness in these Tennessee mountains. And when I got away, I want to stay in hotels, you know. I want to sleep on beds. I don't want to sleep in a sleeping bag. I like a nice warm comforter. Yeah. That's me. You say, you wimp. No, I just, that I'm not a happy camper. But see, because we fall into that problem, we begin to think, because I'm not happy today, I don't have the joy of the Lord. But let me read something to you. The true definition, my definition of joy is simply this. God's joy is a grace that is given to our inward man that is ignited by the Holy Spirit and it's fueled and maintained by the Holy Word of God. Let me read that to you one more time. God's joy is a grace given to our inward man and that, that grace is ignited by the Holy Spirit and that it's fueled and maintained by the Word of God. Here's what we know. The Word of God never changes. Have you noticed that? John 3.16 was the same 100 years ago as it will be 100 years from now. That's a beautiful thing about the Bible. You read the Bible and His promises are true every day. They never change. And since they never change, they're, they're our source. They fuel our joy. They maintain our joy. Thus, we can't allow our moods to control us. But I want to tell you something real quick. Joy is not the absence of sadness. Everybody say that. Joy is not the absence of sadness. It's not the absence of sadness, but it is our spiritual strength. Remember, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And it's the joy of the Lord that carries you through hard, hard times. Because they happen. Just yesterday, I was pulling up in my driveway, and, you know, I have that little thing in my car where I can just talk through the steering wheel, which, praise God, it's cool, and get a phone call, and my little radio, you know, my radio in the car says it's uh, Kim Whitaker. And I thought, oh, wow. If, if you don't remember, Kim and Hubert were here on uh, Labor Day weekend. He was a tall black gentleman. She's his, his wife, and they're a sweet couple. She has some cripple issues, and they were here. And, and uh, in fact, that day... They came to be in church with us. Uh, he, he blessed Jeff. Jeff liked that cap. And he says, I'll give it to you. And that very cap Jeff's wearing, Hubert gave it to him. And, and it was Kim. I said, well, hello there, Kim. How's it going? Like I always open a conversation. And she said, I've had better days. And I said, what's wrong, Kim? She said, Hubert got killed last night. And I said, what? And here's the story. He and a friend were walking down a street you know, just a little road in their neighborhood, and it didn't have much of a shoulder, and, and some young kids just driving too fast, too recklessly, were going down that road, and it was almost dark, and Hubert saw the car coming at a fast speed, pushed his friend out of the way, took the full blow of the car, and was killed instantly. Sad story. And you can't, you can't paint that any other way than sad. Because I tell you, I, Hubert was one of the most lovable men you ever met. He's a life of the party. And he's one of the most giving men. You know, uh, he give you the shirt right off his back. I know that for a fact. He came into church one Sunday wearing a, a, a shirt with guitars all over it. And I said, man, that is the coolest shirt. He said, you want that, Pastor? Okay. And it's hanging up in my closet. He gave it to me. That's Hubert, but he died a hero, saving his friend's life. Can I tell you, Kim was very sad, but I could hear in her voice the joy of the Lord still there. She still had strength in her voice, and she's still hanging. Can I tell you something? Joy is not the absence of sadness. Joy is the strength that gets us through it, see? Joy is that force that lives inside you. Because I want to tell you, there is nothing to shout about when you hear about someone like Kim losing her husband, a 
possibly, I don't know, maybe 40 years they've been married. Great guy. Super guy. But I know where he is. I know he's in heaven. He's with Jesus. He loved the Lord with all of his heart. Can I tell you that the joy of the Lord is what gets us through things? And see, we can't stop the world from giving us bad reports. We can't stop that. We can't stop those phone calls from happening. You say, well, I don't want to hear any bad news. There's going to be bad news on occasion. But it's the joy of the Lord that helps us enjoy, or in, let me say endure. I'm not going to say enjoy. Endure the craziness of this life. Life can get crazy. Life can have turns, it can have ups, it can have downs, it can have high points and low points, but it's joy that gets us through it. And when we understand that, it helps us to live life in a way that the world sees in us something they don't have. See, when something happens that don't go the way you want it to go, can I promise you there are people watching to see how you're going to react. You may not know they're watching, but people are watching. And when things happen in your life that are totally tragic and terrible, there's always someone wondering how they're going to take that. How they're going to react to that. Well, joy gives us the strength to react in a way that when it's all said and done, they still look at us and say, man, i never seen such strength in a lady or a gentleman or a family. In fact, remember, I talked to you last week, and we want to look at it real quick. The Bible writes in Romans 14, 17, it says to us, for the kingdom of God, that's God's kingdom, that's God's rule. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, when he talks about eating and drinking, if you read the context, in that chapter, Paul is writing the Roman church about many traditions that people have fell in. And what happened was he's dealing with these different rules. There's some that say you've got to go to church on this day, and others say, no, it's not a big deal which day you pick. It's just that you go and you serve God. There's others that say, well, you got, if you're going to be a Christian, you've got to be a vegetarian. The others say, no, I can eat what I please. And Paul talks about how that people wrestle with eating and drinking. And what he's really referring to is he's saying that the kingdom of God is not what you do or what you don't do. It's not eat or drink. You say, now why is that a big deal? Because I want to explain something real quick. Righteousness is a lot, because he says, but the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but it's righteousness peace and joy in the Holy Ghost or in the Holy Spirit. Now, when you talk about righteousness, righteousness is doing what's right because it's right. And God wants you, and, and I'll be getting on this a little bit more in a moment, but God wants us to get to that place to where that we don't live right because we're afraid of what God's going to do if we don't. You know, you don't live a righteous life because you're afraid the church will kick you out if you don't. Or you're afraid God will come down with his big holy hammer and belt belt you one. But you do what's right because it's just the right thing to do. Man, when I went to college, I went away. I'd I'd been, you got to understand, if you knew my mom, you know, my mom is a smothering kind of mom. Carla's wrestled with that for 38 years because I'm her only son. And my mom will smother you. My mom is just, she's a sweetheart, but she is a control freak and i grew up and my whole life was super controlled and when you got a kid like i was you needed it i needed a lid i needed a leash i needed control and god knew that i needed it bad but i went off to college and they weren't there anymore and i and i got a little wild because i never had no one for example just one example I uh, would always have to study because they say it's study time. You, got, you better study. Well, I'm in college. And there's all, I learned in college there's a lot more to do than just study. In fact, that was the least fun thing on a college campus is studying. 
And I was never, and, and the Lord gave me a very good mind, and, and, and He blessed me with a memory that I could just memorize things super fast. And so I could get away with not studying. If I glance at it, I know it. So did I study in college? Not a bit. I don't think I spent more than about 10 minutes studying for a test in the whole, you know, through my whole degrees with associates, my, my, my uh, ma uh, let's see, associates, bachelors, masters, all that stuff. I never studied because I didn't have to. And I didn't have mom said, do your work. So I just did it when I wanted to do it. Like going to bed. You go to college, bed is something you don't do till like Saturday. Or Sunday morning. You, you don't go to bed because there's something going on all night and you got a bunch of crazy, you, you, you put 400 guys in one building with like three guys in charge. That's a prison where the inmates take over. It's wild and crazy. I remember pulling my big amp out in the hallway, three, four in the morning, beginning to play Johnny Be Good as loud as I could. And the whole time, oh, what in the world is going on? I rocked that joint, man. They didn't like me in the, in the dorm because I drove them crazy. I was part of the team. And guess what? I didn't go to bed till I had to because I was a crazy college kid. But it dawned on me later, sleep's a good deal. <laughs> you do need to, if you're going to stay awake in class, you do need to go to bed eventually. And I learned to do it because it's just the right thing to do. See, righteousness is saying God... I understand there's things I could do if I want to do and still maybe go to heaven. You ever hear, hear somebody say, well, that's not going to send you to hell. I can do this and it won't send me to hell, but it'll ruin your life. Eating, eating a box of Twinkies every 15 minutes will not send you to hell, but it'll make you sicker than a dog. You know, so you, you finally say, there's some things that they're not going to do my life, but they're going to mess up my life. And see, righteousness is when you say, God, I live right because it's just right. That's kind of maturity, isn't it? But the kingdom of God is not what you do and what you don't do. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, last week I started on this, and I'm going to get into it deep now. And so this is where I'm excited about some of the things God is going to say to us. What does joy do for a child of God? Now, last week I shared with you that, that joy helps us to see that life and purpose is all about who God is, not what we are, not what we have, or what we're going through. And when you get that in your spirit, and joy is what helps you get it in there. It's not, it's not you know, who you are, how people see you. It's not what you have and what's in your closet. It's not what you're going through, it's about God. See, purpose is about am I obeying and living for God. Then also we talked about how the joy works to elevate our faith to a place of unshakable confidence. And I shared with you last week how that joy, the joy of the Lord helps, keeps reminding us over and over that Jesus is all we need. And if we got Jesus, we're going to make it. But today I want to talk about this third thing that joy does for us. And this is good. You're going to get a lot out. I believe God's going to really help you. He's helped me just studying it. Hear this. The joy of the Lord helps, to el to, helps us to evaluate events and experiences through God's perspective. The joy of the Lord helps you to see things differently. And you, and you stop looking at all the events that happen, or you stop looking at all the experiences you're having, and all that's going through, and you begin to see it with the help of joy, you begin to see it through God's glasses. There used to be an old term we'd say, you know, walk a, walk a mile in his mosican. If you walk a mile in that person's shoes, then you'll kind of understand. Because, you know, we meet people and we wonder, why do they act like they act, or why do they do what they do? And sometimes we would never know why they're like they are until we know their story. See, great writers or great movie makers, always do character development. You know, one of the signs of a really terrible book or movie is that they just throw all these characters at you and you don't know why they're doing the things they're doing. But it's so much better if they develop the character and then you can identify. 
You may hate the character, but at least you can kind of see why he is the, the way he or she is. Well, see, joy helps us see things through God's eyes. And when that happens, joy has a purpose in your life. Joy is working hard along with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to develop something, this virtue called patience. Everybody say patience. patience. Nobody likes patience. That's why we have ATMs, drive through windows, fast food. Doesn't say good food. No one ever accused fast food of being good food. It's food that you get fast. And if it's got a little flavor, that's like, yippee, oh, it's a bonus. But as a rule, it's just something, you get it, and you can go. And like I said, if it just happens to taste okay, it's like, oh boy, I won the, the taste bud lottery today. But see, patience has to be in your life. And let me show you some stuff. Because, God, hear this, I'll just tell you what the Holy Spirit gave me this way. God is always, I mean, every minute of the day, He is always working at developing patience in your life. He is. And let me take you to a scripture, James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 2, 3, and 4. Now listen to this. He says, my, my brethren, James is right, and he says, now guys, everybody listen to this. And he says, count it all joy. Now, those first Count it all joy sounds like, oh boy, it's going to be nice. But he's saying, get ready to let joy help you. Re, re, prepare yourself because you're going to need the joy of the Lord. You're going to have to draw strength from the joy of the Lord because things are happening. He said, my brethren, count it all joy when? When what? When you fall into good times? No, that's not what he said. When you win the lottery? No. When you fall into various trials. Count it all joy when time hits you in the gut and life hits you hard. Count it all joy. You say, why? Listen, he says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials knowing. He says, that word know means to truly know it. He's trying to say, you better know this. James is writing and he's saying it to us. Guys, you better know this. You better let it get down on, your, in, on your inside of you because when you go through trials, there's something you've got to know about the trial you're going through. And I, I'd wager, I'm not a betting man, so I, I have no trips to the, to the casino. I don't bet. But I, if I was a betting man, I would bet in a group this size, there's some folks here going through some trials easy i can get in an elevator and figure out somebody's going through a trial for three of us we go through things he says but you need to know this that the that the various trials no, here's why knowing that the testing of your faith see trials are really test of faith is your faith real is your faith sincere is your faith in god or somebody else he says that the testing of your faith produces something it produces patience you know history says that in the early church that the early church called patience the queen of all virtues that's what they felt in early writing when they refer to patience they call it the queen of virtues and here's why they said that because they believed in the days of the bible and in the days of the early church they believed that if you had patience you could endure anything and you got to understand something in the time that James was writing this letter, it was not easy being a Christian. It was actually dangerous. There was great persecution. There's all kinds of things they're going through. It was a hard life. But they knew if I can get patience, I can get through it. In fact, that word patience that he uses, listen to this, it comes from a military term that means to stand your ground no matter how fierce the fighting might become. That's what that word patience in the, in the original Greek meant. It came from the military term that you stand your ground and you don't quit no matter how bloody and dangerous and horrible the fighting might get. And so thus patience is talking about endurance or staying power. So what he's saying is, count it all joy when you fall into various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces staying power. 
But let me take you a little further. Verse 4. Listen to this. But let patience, that's staying power, endurance. Let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete and lacking nothing. He said, guys, you've got to let this thing work out. How many people quit church, give up on God, because there's a tough stretch of life? And they say, I can't do this, it's too hard. He said, guys, no, 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 don't quit. Because something's happening. He says, let patience have its perfect work. That word perfect means mature or full grown. He said, let patience happen. Let God turn you in to a full grown Christian. There's a whole lot of folks that have never left childhood in their Christian experience. He says, no, no, let it work on you. Let it work on you because what's going to happen is going to make you... Because that word perfect doesn't mean flawless. It means mature or full grown. He says, that you, let patience have its perfect work that you, may, that you may be perfect, that's the first one, and complete. That word complete literally means to be fully assembled. My wife and I moved here to town and we need a vacuum sweeper. And we went over to Lowe's and... And uh, we found the deal of the century on this vacuum sweeper. It looked like the deal you never could turn down. And so we bought it, and the guy gave it to us, and, and he says, the only thing is cheaper because it's, it, it's the floor model. You know, it's the one we use as a display. And, and we said, oh, cool, no problem. We took it home, tried to plug it in, and we're going, wait a minute. This is a fake vacuum cleaner. It was a vacuum cleaner without a motor, it didn't have no guts on the inside. It was just the outside shell, but it looked just like it. Now, you know, the, the verse says, for we know all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. We went in there like, hey, what are you doing? And he's looking at me like, why are you buying a half-built vacuum cleaner in the first place? Well, you sold it to me. Well, they gave me all these discounts and we ended up with a really nice Dyson and we didn't have to use that shark, snark or shark or whatever it's called. I mean, so it all worked out. But, buddy, it was freaky trying to make that thing work because it wasn't a real vacuum cleaner. It was a model of one. <laughs> well, let me tell you, there's a whole lot of people that you meet that say, hi, I'm a Christian. Hi, I love Jesus. Don't you know everybody loves Jesus, seems like. I love Jesus. But then when you begin to examine, you find out lots of things are missing. Well, the last thing God wants us to be is a partially assembled Christian. He wants it to be the real deal. He and so he says, let it do its work that you can be perfect, full grown, and will be complete or fully assembled. What's that mean? It means you're fully trained. You know, uh, God wants us to let God teach us how to do life. Hear that. God wants you to get to the place where you know how to do life. Because life's not simple. Have you noticed that? Life can have curves, and high points, low points, tough spots, easy spots. And God says, let all this work. Because when I'm finished with you, you'll be complete. And you know how to do life. I mean, you really know how to do life. That's, the why, that's, why, that's how you witness. People say, how in the world are you surviving? Well, I mean, can I tell you really how to happen? I let God be God in my life. And they say, man, nobody does life like you do life. I do life because I got God. And see, so let it have its perfect work that you may be perfect, complete. And that last one is lacking nothing. What's that mean? He says, I want you to arrive at your spiritual destination. And not that you walk around and say, look at me, I've arrived. But look at me, God is using me. See, God wants you to be fully equipped. See, you're, you're fully trained, then fully equipped with every single tool you need in your toolbox. And God, does, now, I'm a guy that's got a toolbox that don't know what to do with it. But there's a, you, you get a guy that knows his stuff, if he doesn't have his toolbox, he can't do his work. And uh, what God wants us to do is to have a full toolbox and skill with every tool. That's what patience does. As you go through life, life God trains you. 
and he's allowing us, and he's pushing, putting us through things. So let it happen. Now let me read that to you from the Phillips translation. I think it's going to be on the screen too. It says, this is verse number four. But let the process go on until that endurance is fully developed. And you will find you have become men of mature character with the right sort of independence. Yeah. See, God wants to be able to trust us so that we can actually fulfill our destiny. Uh, short, short version of that is God truly wants us to start acting like grown-ups. Grown-up Christians. And uh, that he wants you, us to be grown-ups, body, soul, and spirit. And so we've got to say, Lord Jesus, I want to be living in the right spot of independence. Now, I was talking about me and my folks and stuff. And as parents, all of you have, remember when the kids were little and and if they put on their socks, it's because you put them on. And you remember, uh, with our kids, one of the big ones was helping them learn to tie their own shoe. And uh, there's Caleb. Caleb loved Velcro. Man, he loved Velcro shoes because if, if you know how Caleb's a big guy, and those big old fingers are just, you know, a handful to move, you know. And teaching your child to tie their shoes, if, now if Caleb called me over and said, Dad, I need your help really bad. What's up, son? Ashley's gone, and I can't seem to get my shoe tied. Dad, will you come over? I say, son, you're 29 years old. I think you can tie your own shoe. And I think there's a lot of things we're calling the ch Oh, church, help me get through this. Oh, and I love you. And let me tell you something. As your pastor, I was not sent here to hold your hand, but if you need me in certain times, I'll be here to hold your hand. But, they, you know, if you call me and say, Pastor, I'll hurt. Oh, you want to know what I'm going through? What's wrong? I accidentally burnt the biscuits. You know, the, the little can said 10 minutes. I did 10 minutes, and they're burnt to crisp. How will I make it? And I'll say, you call me for this? I love you, but have your stove checked or something. I don't know. Well, I need you. You need God. We need each other. But God wants us to get to that place where there's some things we just say, God, I'm trusting you. And I can I, If I've got to walk around with shoestrings, I'm not going to ask for help in tying these shoes. They may be flopping in the wind, but I'm going to, I'm going to wear my shoes and just trust that I'm growing up. God wants us to grow up. And patience is about us getting to that place where we grow up. Let me read that to you one more time. But let the process go on until that endurance is fully developed. And you will find you have become men of mature character with the right sort of independence. I'm going to deal with that one more second. There are things you need to be independent on, but not everything. There are, there are places where you better not walk in independence. See, when I, when I pray for you, say you come up for prayer today, I lean heavy on the Holy Spirit. Because I know if God don't do it, it don't get done. Now, I can do that. I can extend my hand, and I can say the words, but I have to depend on God to do the supernatural. See, God wants us to have the right kind of independence. To where, see, can I tell you something? There are angels that are at work on this earth. But angels are not going to fly down from heaven Sit in your living room and read the Bible to you. Angels, now angels may work, say you can't read, angels may work in helping you learn to read or send somebody to help you learn to read. But angels are not going to read your Bible to you. Angels are not going to pray your prayers for you. Angels are not going to witness, witness for you. You've got to pray for yourself. You've got to study the Word for yourself. You've got to win the lost and invite people to church you can say, oh, but I'd rather send the angels. Well, God doesn't use angels that way. He sent us to win the world. And we have the right kind of independence. We trust in God. We trust in his angels' protection. We trust in God's love for us. But God knows there's things we've got to do. Let me read you a verse. And I don't think I'll get to teach this completely today, but I'm going to at least touch on it. 
And then the beautiful thing about it, I'll be back next week. I'll, I'll just touch on this part. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3 says something really powerful. It says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Here's what that's saying. God is saying, you've got to live on planet Earth. You ever met some space cadets out there, some folks? And, 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 and it seems like church attracts folks that tend to get really out there. And sometimes there's folks that are just like, Ooh. well, God didn't call us to walk through Kroger's. Oh, Jesus, show me the right cereal to buy, God. Is it Cheerios or Frosted Flakes, Jesus? No, you don't have... Frosted Flakes is better, right? I heard it from the Lord back there, Frosted Flakes. Yeah. Lord Jesus, which banana? Oh, I know there's a right banana in this batch here, God. No, you don't... That's a little flaky. And what's hurt Christianity is that wonderful collection of fruits and nuts that we have sometimes that, that find their way in the doors. And, and it's not that I'm, I'm not being mean. I'm just saying God wants us to understand that we live on planet Earth. And we walk and we exist on planet Earth. But we do not war according to the flesh. We live a little different than the rest of the world. We understand the presence of of spiritual warfare. We understand. And, and I'm, now let me make this very clear to you. Every event is not a demon coming at you. But there are times where demons are fighting us. And when we understand that there is spiritual warfare. In fact, in, fact, in Ephesians 6, it says to us, in Ephesians 6, 10 through 12, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. God wants you to be strong in God. Strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Here's why. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Now, I know there's some people that have downplayed the devil. But I tell you, he's real, but God's more powerful. Always remember, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And when you understand, yes, there are demons, and yes, we are under attack, but thank God there's somebody on the inside of me that is stronger than every devil of hell. I've got the Jesus himself on the inside of me. Because he says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Your battle is not with that nasty boss you work with. It's not with that neighbor that's an idiot. No, there is more involved than that. Because he, listen to what he says. But it's against principalities, against powers and rulers of the dark age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. He talks about principalities. Now, I'm not going to get into deep teaching, but principalities are those forces that have been set up by Satan for thousands upon thousands of years. Then you have what's known as those principalities. Then powers are those forces that work under them. It's, it's a hierarchy. And then there are rulers of darkness of this age. And lastly, spiritual host of wickedness. Spiritual host of wickedness are those little demons you bump into in life. But those others are like, say, the town mayor demon. And he's telling us that there are satanic forces. But thank God we have armor. And thank God we are strong in the Lord. And when we understand that, we understand we walk in the flesh, but we do not war according to the flesh. So if we back up real quick to 2 Corinthians 10 again, but verse 4 and 5, he says, for the weapons of our warfare, the things you're use, using to fight with, they are not carnal, but mighty in God. That word mighty in God refers in the Greek to a supernatural army that is fighting with such power and force that nothing can stop it. And when you understand that the weapons that we've been given, they're not regular weapons, but they're mighty. They're charged with the power of God. And who is fighting for you is so powerful. And what is working through you is so much more powerful than that which is opposing you. Even mighty in God for the pulling down of strong, strongholds. That word means to break something apart piece by piece that when you're done, it's dust. Isn't that something? 
the strongholds that have tried to hold you, the chains that have come against you, the walls Satan has, has built around you. God has put somebody in you as the power of the Holy Spirit that can crush it to the point that it looks like dust on the furniture. That's what God's put in us. The pulling down the strongholds. We talked about those last week. Casting down arguments. Arguments consist of human logic. That can't happen. That shouldn't happen. We wrestle with that. And every high thing, that's fears and, and, and reasonings, high things that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Lastly, let me end with this. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. God has given us weapons that if we use them, you can control your thought life. You ever heard somebody say, well, it's just in his head. A lot of the stuff we battle is just in our head. But God's given us the weapons to control what's attacking our head. And when God gets finished with you, you're going to be more than a conqueror. I love that in the Word, that we are more than conquerors. That we walk through life and we live our life and we're not victims and we're not victimized. And even though life, you know, the beautiful thing about our dear friend Kim, who lost her husband, Hubert, you could still hear the hope in her voice because she knows the God that put them together and sustained their marriage through all these years is going to take care of her. Can I tell you, I don't know what you're facing, but the God that got you here today is going to get you through this week and the next week and the next week, and he's, and he's going to help you if you'll let him. He'll help you put every thought under captivity to where that when a thought comes in your head, Remember, you cannot stop thoughts from coming, but you can quickly say, out of my head, I'm not entertaining you. You can say, you can stand up and say, my mind is my mind, and I refuse to think about that. You say, well, isn't that living in la-la land? No, that's walking by faith and not by sight. It's putting my trust in God and saying, I will trust God, and I will not allow my mind to be dirtied up with every lie from hell. I'm not going to be a prisoner of fear. I'm not going to be a worry wart. I'm going to look at life and understand there's a God factor. Let's stand our feet. Because understand this. You're not like everybody else. You say, why? Because you have the God factor. You have God in your life. See, life is scary. If you, have, if you don't have God. But if you got God, everything changes quickly. And I don't know where you are as a group today, but maybe there's someone in this room that says, I don't have God. Or maybe God don't have you. You, you want Him, but he's not, He doesn't possess your life. He, he's not in control. He's not running things. And this is a wonderful time for your battle to change drastically by just allowing God to be in the proper place. Remember, there's one passage in the Bible where they're going against a great enemy and they say to them, the prophet stands up and says, the battle belongs to the Lord. That is a biblical truth that resonates in the ears of every Christian that listen. Your battles are God's. And if you're going through something, God says, let me have it. I can handle it. I can tear down. And so I'm going to ask for every head bowed and every eye closed right now. And I want to ask you today, is there anyone in this room that says, Pastor, I'm going through a fight. I'm going through a struggle. I'm going through a season of hardness. And I need God to either work in my imagination. I need God to tear down some strongholds. I need God to give me a special strength. I just need God to do something. And I want you praying for me, Pastor. Is there somebody say, Pastor, that's me. I've got some things. God bless you. Anybody else? Say, hey, there are some others. I'm going through things and I need God to do something. Anybody else? Because here's the deal. If you'll give it to God, can I tell you something? He'll take it. The one thing God keeps reminding me over and over again as a parent, when my kids do life their own way instead of my way I chosen for them God says did you not dedicate them to me 
And I did. We dressed them in little white outfits and brought them down the altar, and we had them prayed for, and we gave them to Jesus. You know what God said to me about it? He said, I took them. You brought them, and you said, Lord, I give them to you. He said, you know what I did? I took them. The Bible says to you, casting all your cares on him, for he cares for you. God says, hey, give it to me. Here's what I want you to do. If you're going through something, and you're tired of carrying it, Remember, in the, in the one song we sang today, it says, if you're tired and you're thirsty, there's freedom. What God is saying, that if you're tired and wore out of trying to make life work for you and you need God, he said, there's freedom. There's freedom. Freedom means it comes free and it sets you free. It releases you of that responsibility and that problem. See, God doesn't charge, but he takes the battle, places it in his hand, and then carries you across the finish line. Isn't that awesome? If you're here this morning and you say, I need freedom in something, I need God to do something in my life, and I want to give it over to him, I want you to step out of your seat and walk down here. I want to pray with you. I, I give you that opportunity. Is there anybody that would say today, I need God to...